Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So as promised, this is going to be my Game of Thrones religions video. So I'm going to talk about some of the really big gods as well as some of the really obscure ones too. Martin went to Tolkien-esque links in developing religions for the world of Song of Ice and Fire. I'll start with the gods that the show has done so far and then dive into some of the other ones from the books. Some of them are featured a lot more than others. The good thing is we can talk about religions without getting too spoilery for season 5 or for people that haven't read books 4 or 5. But if you're just finding me for the first time, I'm doing weekly Game of Thrones videos. I'm also doing that weekly book giveaway. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave a comment on this video. Just in case, general spoiler warning for everything through season 4 on the show. I'll wait just a sec. Okay, ready? Here we go. First is Roller, the Red God. Thanks to Melisandre and Thoros, we know more about him than almost any of the other gods. Very important though, that does not imply that he is the most important god. It's just he's been featured the most. Roller is based on the real-world Iranian religion of Manichaeism. It's a dualistic view of the world where you have the god of light and goodness on one side and the god of evil and darkness on the other. In the books, Melisandre calls Roller the Lord of Light and names his enemy the Great Other, the god of the White Walkers. I tend to think of the two of them as existing in this yin and yang situation where it's all about balance, not so much evil and good. The show has presented them in much more black and white terms, but I'm hoping future books like Winds of Winter provide some more context before we straight up classify who's the hero and who's the villain. There's no official start date for worship of either of these gods, but you can consider them at least as old as the old gods. Worship of the Red God is much more popular in the East and has started to take hold in Westeros in a few groups, but Thoros of Myr was actually sent over to convert Ares II, the Mad King, and he absolutely was not convinced. Thoros was not successful. However, Melisandre was successful in turning Stannis. In Season 2, we saw him burning the Statues of the Seven as a way to show his newfound faith in the Red God. So far on the show, Melisandre and Thoros have been like our conduit to the Red God, you know, how we learn new things about him. Most of what we've seen so far involves sacrificial rites to invoke a blessing, or gain visions, or birthing shadow creatures. It's like you offer something of high value, and if the Red God favors you, he grants you a vision, or an outcome, or a shadow baby. The clergy can be men or women, but not everyone employed by the faith is a priest. Their church buys children as slaves, and names them Slaves of Roller. Those people can go on to serve in the Red Temples and have a number of jobs. In Volantis, there's actually this custom where they tattoo the slaves' faces with flames. It's not meant to be punitive, it's actually just a sign of their servitude, and it's viewed as an honor. Organizationally, there's a lot of different jobs that people can have. There's priests, temple prostitutes, just regular servants, or temple guards. So the temple guards are actually called the Fiery Hand. They're not like an organized military, but they're pretty close to it. Each of the organized faiths have their own form of military, you know, maybe with the exception of the old gods, but technically that's not an organized religion. General worship is organized around red temples, what they call their churches. There are seven known ones in the world right now. The biggest one is in Lys. The reason Melisandre and Thoros don't have those face tattoos though, even though they were probably slaves at one point, is probably just because they did not live in Volantis. And a lot of people are wondering where Melisandre's tattoos are. Hopefully in Season 5 we'll be traveling around the East just a little bit more and seeing a couple new locations so we might see some of those tattooed priests. There are a lot of notable characters in the novels inside the Faith of the Red God that we haven't seen on the show yet. And since we don't know what the show is going to include, I'm just going to wait to talk about them till the season starts. Some of them get tied up in some of the bigger plots, so I don't want to get too crazy with spoilers, but if you want to talk about them, feel free and just use spoiler tags in the comments. As the story of A Song of Ice and Fire continues, the religions themselves become much bigger characters. For those that have read the books, they were trying to film this really notable scene from Book 4 in Dubrovnik around this church, but the local faith would not let them do it. This is the actual production. Right now the producers have found no workaround, it's kind of funny, but if you want to talk about that, please also use spoiler tags in the comments below. But it just gives you an idea of how the show as well as the books start to focus more on the religions as factions. In general though, we start to see more influence from various religions, just like the Iron Bank of Bravos became a big character in Season 4. Some of the religions in the world are just as powerful as the Iron Bank. The Church of the Red God just happens to be one of those. One of the really cool things about the Red God though is that he is actually granted powers to Melisandre and Thoros, so we know that he actually exists. Amongst the prayers that he does grant include visions of the future, blessings on the outcome of encounters or battles, shadow puppets, and a measure of resurrection. So the important thing to remember about Melisandre seeing things in the flames is that they are completely subjective, but it's like she prays for certain things and the Red God sends her visions and she has to interpret those. So it's totally possible for her to be wrong. For example, she keeps telling Stannis that he is Azor Ahai, but secretly I think that she doesn't believe that. And for those that have read Book 5, you'll know that when she does look into the flames, she sees someone else altogether. 
Remember, spoiler tags in the comments. I think it's just evidence that the Red Priests are every bit as normal as any of the other characters. Thoros is a total drunk to boot. And it's also totally possible for Red Priests, like, you know, Thoros and Melisandre, to completely disagree on something. So, say Melisandre found Azor Ahai, some other Red Priest could say, no, this other person is Azor Ahai. So they're not in complete consensus on everything. The one possible exception to that is the belief in the Great Other. They all probably, regardless of, you know, who they think their messiah is, believe that the Great Other is their greatest enemy. Regardless of whether or not he's evil, he is the other half of the dueling gods. There are theories that he's not the antagonist of the series, like it's possible that if there's a final battle between the forces of fire and ice, the forces of the red god could totally be the villains. I did like a whole video on that, so I'll include a link to that in the description. The only known followers of the Great Other are the White Walkers, that are also called the Others. Melisandre calls them his cold children, which kind of makes you think about the Children of the Forest, which is a completely different group. There's a rumor that the Three-Eyed Raven, who's kind of associated with the Children of the Forest, is a servant of the Great Other. That's the person that Bran met in the finale. That's not confirmed or anything, it's just another theory from the show that's open to interpretation. So like I said, there's no known start date for that dualistic religion, but the White Walkers are known to have appeared about 8,000 years before Aegon's conquest. There's been no indication that they have any form of hierarchy, but the show did supposedly do the Night's King, who's supposedly some sort of White Walker leader, although there's some debate as to whether or not that was an error of the show. Like they call him the Night's King in error. They're not really an organized religion though, you can think of them more as a species. If you look at what the show presented, it appears that White Walkers turn humans to their power as children, and adults they simply just kill and reanimate as corpses to be used as infantry. But the next big group of deities are the Old Gods, or you could call them the Gods of the Forest. Their power is represented in all the Weirwoods in the north. Most of the Weirwoods have been cut down in the south, so it's thought that they don't have power down there anymore. And as similar as a lot of these deities sound, I think that they're distinct. I, th I think the old gods are different from Roller, who's different from the Great Other. I don't think it's all the same god. The closest thing that the old gods have to clerics and priests are the Children of the Forest and the Green Seers, who we've really only just met on the show. Supposedly Bran is becoming a Green Seer, or he is one. We don't really know how many Children of the Forest are left alive, but presumably we're going to see more in Season 5. Hopefully, unless they totally drop Bran's story. Most of the humans who worship or worshipped the old gods were from the north, like the first men. But now typically the only people that follow them are the free folk and the Starks, like the people that still live in the far north. They really don't have a lot of ceremonies or customs other than saying prayers in the godswood where the heart trees are. Those are weirwoods with the faces drawn on them that exist inside the castles of Westeros, but most of them have been chopped down. It's believed that the trees are the old gods who have died and become part of the great godswood. That's like the massive interconnected root system that supposedly runs throughout the planet. You actually kind of get a glimpse of this root system whenever they travel into the Cave of the Three-Eyed Raven. Like I said, I don't know how much of Bran's story they're going to include next season, but presumably we'll learn more about this root system and how all the weirwoods are connected. And hopefully we'll learn whether or not the Three-Eyed Raven is associated with the Great Other, because that would actually be a really big deal. In Westeros, the Old Gods were the primary faith until the Andals invaded and brought the Faith of the Seven. I guess you could think of that as being like the Catholic Crusades, although the Andals appear to have been far more successful in taking over and converting the First Men than the Catholics were with Islam. But like I said, since the Andal invasion, most of the Weirwoods in the south have been cut down, thus the Old Gods have no more power there anymore. So the next big group is the Faith of the Seven. They're basically like the main religion of Westeros, and they're going to be really big in Season 5. They actually just cast the High Septon, which is kind of like the Pope. Think of the religion as being like the Greek polytheistic pantheon, only in practice working a lot more like traditional Christianity in terms of organized worship. There are seven gods, but people can pray to any of the seven gods based on what they're praying for. There's the father who represents judgment. He's depicted as a bearded man carrying scales. People pray to him for justice. There's the mother who represents motherhood and nurturing. She's depicted by a woman smiling with love. People pray to her for fertility and compassion. Then there's the warrior, who represents strength in battle. He looks like a soldier carrying a sword. People pray to him for courage and victory. Then there's the maiden, who represents innocence. People pray to her to protect women's virginity and virtue. Then there's the smith, who represents the crafting arts and manual labor. He looks like a blacksmith carrying a hammer. He's prayed to whenever they're doing work or big things are being built. Then there's the crone, who represents wisdom. She looks like an old woman carrying a lantern. People pray to her for guidance. And then there's the stranger, who represents death and the unknown. He's kind of a creepy god. Usually the only people that pray to him are outcasts and assassins. 
they do have a Bible. It's called the Seven Pointed Star, Seven Points for Seven Gods. It tells a really interesting origin story for the religion. Supposedly, the seven originally walked on earth in human form, and the father brought down seven stars from the sky and used them to form the crown of Hugor of the hill. He was the first king of the Andals, and the rest of the other gods' origin stories are kind of tied up in aspects of Hugor's rise to power. It gets kind of funny. If you examine it real closely, it sounds almost like Hugor united the Andals, and then people created a religion around him. So, of all the gods in A Song of Ice and Fire, the seven, at least in my opinion, sound the most false. That doesn't mean that they are, but whenever a religion's based on a king telling everyone how awesome he is, it just rings a little bit false. In Westeros, the faith got so powerful that they developed their own military and it started a civil war. Eventually it ended and the Targaryen kings banned them from ever taking up arms again. Structurally, the church is organized a lot like the Catholic Church. You know, you have Septas, Septons, and the High Septon. Their main church is called the Great Sept of Baelor in King's Landing. It's the building where Sansa was married to Tyrion and Joffrey was married to Marjorie, so the show has already been there. There are a lot more sects and subgroups inside the church, but it is one of the most complicated religions in Westeros, so I'll spend a lot more time talking about it whenever we get into the season. Their military, though, is actually really interesting. It was called the Faith Militant. It's featured heavily in Book 4, so if you do want to learn about them before Season 5, be sure to read Feast for Crows. And please, use spoiler tags if you're going to comment about them. I know I just implied that the Seven might be a little bit bogus, but in the Iron Islands, they worship the Drowned God. He's just as old as the Old Gods, and I do think that he has some power. Just like the Old Gods, Roller, and the Great Other, the Drowned God predated the Andal invasion. And because the original Ironborn were a pirate culture, their worship kind of rose up around those practices. So supposedly the Drowned God wants them to rape and pillage and make great conquests in his name. The interesting thing is that the Drowned God also exists in a dualistic nature with the Storm God, one above the sea, the other below. One of their big customs is that whenever a new follower is anointed or baptized, they forcibly drown him, like he actually dies for a little while and then they resuscitate him. After that they can go on to become priests or just live normal lives, but the priests are known as the drowned men, like that's what their name is. Their big saying is, what is dead may never die. And a lot of that's tied up when, with the fact that they've been drowned and literally killed, like they're literally dead people. That doesn't mean that they're zombies or anything, but I have a feeling that that belief kind of arose from the idea that sailors died all the time, and it just became a coping mechanism. The last big religion in Westeros is Roiner. Their god is the Mother Roin. It's practiced mostly in the southmost parts of the kingdom, like Dorne, so presumably we'll see a little bit of it whenever we visit that place in Season 5. Their deity is a river goddess, but the river that she's based on exists in the east. Whenever those followers migrated to Dorne, they just brought it with them. But the big river that runs through Dorne is called the Greenblood, so most of the practicers of that religion live along the river. So, moving along back to the east, Bravos is one of the most interesting religious places on the show, or in the novels, just because there's a greater diversity of deities worshipped there than in any other place in the world. Aside from the other major deities who are all worshipped there, the most infamous one is the Many-Faced God, the one that the Faceless Men worship. In total, there are more than 18 separate deities with shrines or temples inside the city that people worship too. That number includes some of the ones that I've already mentioned, but some of the more obscure ones include Aquan the Red Bull, Bacalon, the Great Shepherd, the Hooded Wayfarer, the Horse God, that's actually the God of the Dothraki, the Lady of the Spears, that's actually the God of the Unsullied, the Merlin King, the Moon Pale Maiden, the Pattern, Samash and Saloso, who are actually twin gods, the Silent God, the Stone Cow of Pharos, Trios, and the Weeping Lady of Lys. They are filming scenes in Bravos for season 5, so hopefully they'll show some of this diversity, but the show does not get really deep with the mechanics of religion, so don't expect like really big explainers, aside from maybe some of the major religions. In real life, George R. R. Martin based all these gods and religions just on a mishmash of real life historical ones like animism, Catholicism, polytheism, and Norse mythology. Right now I'll say that the Red God is probably my favorite because he's presented as being so benevolent, but he seems so sinister. And then you look at his enemy, the Great Other, who's presented as being very sinister, but who we know almost nothing about. Supposedly Winds of Winter is going to change that though, so get excited. 
So I'm going to do a Q&A for this video. Be sure to subscribe to get it. I'll post it tomorrow. My next bonus video is probably going to be about the civil war that rose up between the Faith Militant and the Targaryen Kings, just because I feel like that's going to be something that the show is going to deal with. So I think it's going to be really interesting. In the meantime, click here to get that Q&A. I'll have the annotation as soon as I post it. And click here to learn about my top five prophecies on the show. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tomorrow. High fives.